Welcome to the AlphaList podcast. I am your host, Toby. AlphaList is a closed community with over 400 CTOs who share their knowledge and experience in a Slack space and at events. With this podcast, we want to give our members and interested parties insights into the thoughts and ideas of top CTOs. If you're interested in becoming a member of the community, please visit alphalist.com to find out more on how to apply. Thanks a lot to our sponsor, MongoDB. MongoDB is the database that developers love. It's simple to manage, scale, and it stores JSON documents instead of columns or rows. The folks at MongoDB offer a special free education program. They teach you on how to operate it in the cloud, how to use it for machine learning purposes, how to integrate it into your serverless stack. Very interesting stuff. They are hosting a virtual German live event happening on the 8th of December. If you're interested in attending for free, just go to mongodb.live and pick your location. Welcome to the AlphaList podcast. I'm your host, Toby, and today... I got a man with a complicated ma a name called Jean-Michel Lemieux. And uh, because I ha just had DHH on the podcast one week ago, um, I tried to call him JML for the rest of the podcast. So um, thanks, JML, for being my guest. Uh, you are the CTO of Shopify. And Shopify is uh, one of the companies that really went north, uh, as people say, in the last 25, uh, 24 months. Um, I think it's worth 120 billion, at least it, it has been worth uh, that, that much a few days ago. Um, so welcome. Is uh, JML an okay nickname for you? It's perfect. As you said, I, I guess it follows really well with DHH. It feels like if you have a long, complicated name at some point in your life, someone's going to shorten it. And whether you like it or not, that's what sticks. So uh, JML is uh, was shortened by my Australian friends a while ago, and it's stuck. So yeah, you're happy, Toby, for you to to keep the JML thing going. <laughs> okay. So um, JML, can you maybe tell us a bit more about your nerd path? So how did you get into engineering? How did you also discover Ruby? Because Shopify, I think, is purely written on Ruby. Um, can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, so I, I started... Um, not, you know, I wasn't programming when I was young, so I actually started a bit older. I was actually um, in fine arts and music uh, as a kid. So in high school, I did a, basically I was a painter, a portrait drawer, and a musician. And um, in grade 12, I believe, as part of the music class, we were doing a musical for Phantom of the Opera and Les Miserables. And I told, um, I told my music teacher that my dad just bought me a, a computer, uh, an Atari ST, uh, and that I could probably sequence the entire musical myself and you can fire the band, which again, this is like pre-automation. I was like, I think I can do a couple of songs. So I, I did a couple of songs. I, you know, pre-recorded, sequenced them and I played a track live. And at that point as a, as a musician, I was like, man, computers give me superpowers. Like, this is amazing. So um, was that MIDI then or what, what did yeah, you use? Like, okay. Yeah, it was Cubase. So it was a Cubase version 1.1. So if you actually go Google... Uh, like like the first version of Cubase, um, like I mean, it's pretty simple stuff, right? You're recording some tracks. It's MIDI based. I hooked up my uh, my keyboard to it. Um, I think a Roland SD40, I believe. Um, and and at that point, I was like, it was amazing. I remember my, my parents were in the audience. My granddad was there. This was probably like I, I still remember the drama's teacher's face going like, "What the hell are you doing? This is crazy!" And then we did a rehearsal, and I pulled it off, and uh, and then. I kept doing music and at some point I had to figure out where to go to school. And my, I, I literally went to my guidance counselor. I'm like, I don't know what to do with my life. And she's like, you kind of like these computers, don't you? And I'm like, well, they're just a tool, I, I, I guess. And she's like, why don't you go into computers? And you know, at that time, my parents knew no one who's in computer science. Like there was no, like, there was no peers. I didn't know one who said this as a profession. This was 1990, 1989. Like no one, I, I knew no one who did this. So I accidentally got into programming through that. I remember being in my first computer science course, looking around and realizing there's a lot of people who've been programming in high school and I haven't. I was kind of a bit intimidated. Um, but I think what I, what I saw in computers, what I fell in love with is the power of creation. 
And I think that's my artist side is I found that I could create things with it. And I just, you know, went from painting to programming as a very natural evolution. Right. So of, from, from musician to writer in a way. Yeah. Okay. So which, which instruments were you playing? I think drums you mentioned or? I played all the saxophones, guitar and piano. So I started with baritone, alto, um, tenor and uh, yeah, piano and guitar. And then you convince your parents that you rather not study music, but uh, go for IT. Yeah, exactly. IT, computer, uh, uh, keyboard. As you said, I went from one keyboard to another. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, what was your professional career about then? Um, I think you, you were working for Atlassian, um, but, but what else? So I, I you know, did a, a regular developer job. And when I graduated, um, the place where a lot of developers were working was in the telecom industry. So if you go back to the early 90s, um, the, the evolution was going from analog to the digital. So people were building to the, like the telephone networks that we have right now, like, prior to, like just five years pre-internet, it was digitizing the telephone network. So we were building switches, um, creating uh, digital, there's basically this protocol called SS7, which is kind of the digital backbone to the, to the telephone networks that lets us build services like 1-800 numbers, callback, like all these automation services in, in the telephone network was where a lot of us um, were spending time. So building fraud detection systems, like we're like, hey, we can bring like software into the telephone network wow, what can we do, right? Like that's literally where the, the first part of my career was. Is, and it, what was fascinating, it was, it was a precursor to, I'd say, cloud computing, right? The, the, the telephone network was a cloud of telephony and we're doing things like fraud detection. Um, you know, we're running uh, like high, like super high bandwidth um, uh, uh, like systems that were cute, like, because the phone network had a lot of traffic. And, you know, one of the, one of the biggest uh, days of the year was Mother's Day. Because Mother's Day is when everyone phones their mom. And, you know, so whatever, you know, we, I remember we're, I was working for Hewlett Packard and we we're building a, a fraud detection and, and a system. So we had to take all the telephone traffic, pipe it through some algorithms, do some analysis on it, all this fun stuff. And, and like, like Mother's Day was in, like at Shopify now, it's Black Friday. That's obviously the biggest day, which is in two days from now. But for, for my early career, it was Mother's Day in the telephone network. So, so I went through building a lot of real-time systems. You're doing like TCP IP, nonce, like, like, It literally is cloud computing of like 20 years ago. Um, and then I, you know, uh, I was one of the founding members of the Eclipse platform as well. So if you've used Eclipse, Jet, like the IDE, et cetera. So a lot of developer tools, um, I find that like in the early years of this profession, like we're just trying to figure out what kind of tools do we want people to use? Like, what is it like, what's a developer, like how do we make developers productive was like a passion of mine. <laughs> like having written a lot of code, you know, just trying to figure out like, how can we like, There must be better ways. It must be easier to do that. So that brought me on the journey of working on the Eclipse um, for probably 10 years or so, going to Atlassian, which was, again, very much in the same, like, how do we make teams? How do we make developers productive? Um, and I think I accidentally found Shopify. Um, and, and you're working on similar tools there as well, right? You can maybe tell us... Uh, something about that later. Um, but you, you just mentioned Black Friday. I'm quite impressed that you actually do the podcast two days before Black Friday. So how, how do your days look look like these these days? I mean, is there some war room at Shopify where uh, Toby sits uh, at a large sofa and observes the whole scenery? Or how does it, how does it look like? I mean... <laughs> well, this year it's going to look a bit different. We do usually actually have a room... Uh, like an operations room where we have, we bring all the big TVs into it. Uh, we watch kind of every metric. And our, our goal again is Black Fridays should be boring. Uh, you know, we spend the whole year getting ready for it. Uh, so this podcast, as I said, it was two days before Black Friday, but we're done. Deploys are locked. We're just twiddling our thumbs at this point. So uh, this sounds like a, a good thing to do. But I mean, the reality too is um, one of the things we've done a lot at Shopify over the last couple of years is, um, Our, our, our pre-BFCM training program. And what I mean by that is um, if you've built cloud software, I feel like we've gotten lazy. At cloud software developers and platforms, we got lazy because just going back to developer tools, our developer tools are great, right? We can deploy software instantaneously. We can roll forward. You can deploy 100 times a day. And what that means is, is I've seen a lot of organizations and engineering teams get a bit lazy going, well, when something happens in production, we just fast, you know, we'll fix it and we, we roll forward. And, and the other thing about cloud that's been complex is it's hard to create um, uh, 
I'd say like testing environments that actually simulate exactly what's in production, right? It's like, how do I create a version of Shopify that has the exact same traffic, but it's not the real one that I can go and, and, and like practice on. Like that's like really hard, right? You've got to, you're thinking about network topology. How do you, how do you actually uh, mirror the exact same traffic? And a lot of the h- super high scale projects around the globe, like that's one of the biggest challenges. But what we've done at Shopify over the last couple of years is, is to the best of our abilities, create a bit of like a, a, um, a training version of Shopify that we can actually load test on um, we can try things on way before they happen in, in you know, I'd say in production with our, our live customers. Um, and this is something, again, the space industries had to do, right? When, when the cost of, of errors are really high, a lot of it, like some of the world's best engineering teams have to, had to create simulations, right? Simulations for uh, air travel, for rockets, SpaceX, like they don't like lo- just launch the first one. And so that's something that some of the stuff we're doing at Shop with them, I'm really excited about is, is how do we take some of those learnings of like the physical engineering spaces and bring that a bit more to software where like we do have to, like we have to simulate Black Friday before it happens almost every day. So we actually know exactly, you know, what our bottlenecks are. We have to understand what, you know, what the cascading failures, what our tripwires are. So we've been spending the last three, four years at Shopify actually building that out, like our simulation environments so that today I can be a bit calm. Because you know what? We've seen everything that's probably going to happen. Now, our biggest risk on Black Friday is usually third-party software, which we don't have as much control over, which mm-hmm. the internet is, you know, someone randomly, you know, adds their their include file in their theme and and we have a, less, a, a lot less control over. So. Hey, yeah, I mean, you, you have an ecosystem, right? So it's kind of hard to, to simulate the, the reaction of every involved party, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. So we, I mean, we'll do an eighty percent. Like we can simulate the things we know about. We also, you know, we we know the uh, the apps that are most popular. We know the customizations people have done, and we include that in our, our simulation environment. Uh, but you know, you know as as well as I do that the internet is a, a wild place, and it just takes that one JavaScript include to uh, include twenty versions of jQuery and bloat your page and or do a recursive call to the cart and take us down kind of thing so uh one of the funniest stories about black friday so reminder was about six seven years ago you know we're in our war room we're looking at all the dashboards and we have this command called spy shops and it shows the most trafficked shops on the platform and one of the shops was a dog goggle shop you know so people actually do this you can buy goggles for your dog so for some reason, if they don't want to get their eyes wet, if they're I don't know, they're skiing or they're water skiing, whatever it is, like there's goggles for that. And I'm like, how in God's name could the goggle shop be the top, like in the top 10 shops at Shopify on Black Friday? Like did someone run, like spend millions of dollars on advertisement? And so I looked into it and of course they had an infinite loop on their theme, which was calling our, cot, our cart.js endpoint. And they're basically DDoSing us with some stupid JavaScript code, right? So, yeah, the, like it's the Wild West. Like, like front end developments, I don't know. Like, the, we have a lot of work to to make it a lot less brittle. But yeah, I remember uh, phoning up the merchant, going, "Do you mind if I change your theme?" And uh, we've never seen Gog Doggles in the top ten shops since then. So, okay, okay, but I, but I can imagine that it's like kind of a very hard task to actually allow developers um, to, to do a lot on your platform. I mean, templates is simple, I think. Front-end development already gets gets harder. Uh, how do you make sure that quality is right? How do you make sure that the, the templates are not causing too much time, rendering time, and so on? So we, we've um, we favored creativity over full control. So we like if you think of what Shopify is about, we're the platform behind the platform. Like our job is to make merchants be able to do crazy commerce experiences, which is the you know the exact opposite of I'd say other marketplaces whose job is to I'd say make commerce as boring as possible because you have a palette of two colors and it's it's not experiential. So like our our raison d'être is to create flex is to give people flexibility, and what we're trying to do is make sure we've got the right tripwires right. So we like we've got really good monitoring around um, our APIs, around throttling, around you know our ability to understand like what's actually happening on the platform. And then I think we, you know, over time we've put, you know, different tripwires um, as we've seen things happen. But I think it's really important for us is we almost want people to do crazy things on Shopify. And our API has been a really good way of doing that. But we have to, you know, obviously we have to protect the platform. And that's what we've, I mean, that's where we put a lot of our engineering effort is just, you know, not 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 uh, uh, not getting in the way of the creativity, but making sure it doesn't, it, you know, on Black Friday, it doesn't, doesn't get ahead of us. So... Okay, 
but it's hard to imagine. I mean, there are tools out there like WooCommerce, for example. I, I think it's a competitor in a way. Um, as an engineer, it's kind of kind of bad if you if you see their ecosystem, if you see the the plugins that are possible there. Um, it's 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 hell on earth, right? Quality wise, uh, I mean, there's uh, a lot of stuff that that sneaks into your software that slows down your software. Um, are you that open as well um, in terms of, of uh, allowing code, or is it only it's the, really just the front the, end side? Which the you front end side. The other thing we've done at Shopify, just from a, a engineering decision, is um, you really can't customize much of the checkout because commerce is about exchange of, of goods and money, and that's something that we don't let people kind of mess around with too much, right? Like I think there's a lot of value, and you adopt Shopify, you get our battle hardened checkout that's done billions and billions of dollars. We kind of know what conversion looks like. You can't mess around. Now you can mess around with like, you know, how your your online store and your your clothing site looks like. But once you get the checkout and you get into the Shopify, we do take over control of that. Um, and we don't let you extend it. Where I think some other platforms have probably allowed a bit too much, you know, flexibility there. And I think that's um, I think once money starts exchanging, then we we take control. And that's something we can battle harden. We test that. Everyone's getting the default fastest, quickest checkout and battle hardened. So you're right. Like, you know, it's almost like if you look at Shopify, like at the edges on the side is like extreme flexibility. And as you get to the middle, we kind of tighten the reins a lot more. But but still, Absolutely. it's all white labeled, right? So um, you won't exactly. recognize that it's, it's Shopify. Okay. Um, maybe let's let's step uh, get a step go a step back um, and uh, talk a bit about your company culture. I think that's also unique, right? I think Toby is, as far as I know, a, a gamer and a very active gamer, right? Um, is He's that, very is active. That, that's gamer, still the yes. case, right? And his three yeah. kids, they they game all the time. <laughs> and his wife, he met his wife gaming too, uh, right? Uh, is is in your your uh, company culture? So here's the thing, people lot, uh, mistake gaming with, um, you know, first person shooters or, you know, or just like, like a waste of time. But I think what Toby sees in gaming and what I think the, the, the biggest impact on our culture is a lot of games are um, like strategic, right? You've got to see, yeah, you need, really need a system mindset, right? You start building a game like Civilization or, or uh, like a lot of the more strategic games is it, it forces you to almost um, play out a scenario, like a, a big chess, complex chess match and understand the impacts of short-term, medium-term and long-term decisions and make a good balance view of those. And I think, um, you know, similarly to, I don't know if you know the story about how the Brazilian soccer team practices, they realize that, um, when you practice 11 on 11, you don't touch the ball a lot, you know? So it's like, Hey, let's do, let's do game three against three or six against six. And that way you can touch the ball a lot more often. You get to practice a lot. So for us, gaming is literally a way to play a strategic game. That's very much like building a company where it's a complex environment. You've got to make short-term, medium-term and long-term decisions. You have to understand kind of the, the mechanics at play. You have to understand, you know, what things you can cheat at and what you can't. So I think gaming is uh, a bit like, like the, the Brazilian soccer is a way to practice playing these strategic games. So when you come and build a company, you, you have the, a very, very similar environment. And are you able to, um, you know, like see the whole gameplay? Are you able to like, ha have, have you practiced doing that? So for us, gaming is literally possibly the best training experiments for building a company. And um, I think that's, that's where it's influenced our culture a lot is we, you know, uh, we try and bring that strategic thinking to like, like actually deeply understanding this, this complex company we're building and let's not cargo call it what everyone's done. But we, we, we believe that if, if, if we make a good set of bets, right, that are, that are balanced for the long term and, and short term, medium term well, that we could possibly be 10% better than all the other companies out there. Cause it's, it's extremely complex to do well. So I think that's how gaming's um influenced us a lot and um i think toby's loves it does it does it mean that the management team meets on a starcraft server every once in a while or <laughs> not not all of us i think we've got a very diverse team some of us you know do this in different ways but yeah we do uh we, we did meet for our offsite in vr last week which was interesting <laughs> and it, does it then mean that you have a bit of a nerdy culture i think pretty nerdy yeah, I mean, it's like, like, what do you mean by nerdy? I think uh, 
we're, we're very, we're, we're trying to be internet native. Like a lot of us grew up in the internet, you know, and I think if you define that as nerdy, yes, we're, uh, you know, like a, a lot of developers at Shopify grew up on the internet. Um, you know, we, we love our memes. We love our inside, uh, geeky jokes. And, um, we also believe that like Shopify could be the, like if Shopify was the most technical literate company, that we would ha also have a, a, a leg up on, on a lot of companies. Like a lot of things we have to do, like you have to write code. You know, there, there's um, like a lot of people at the company doing different jobs and a lot of them are important, but at the end of the day, like building Shopify and what our merchants get is the code that we write. So I think we like the engineering um, culture, the, the role of engineers, like we, we appreciate has a, a huge amount of leverage in what we're doing. And we, we try not to hide that, you know? <laughs> It's, it's, so it's very geeky, geeky at the top, you know, uh, Toby, myself, uh, uh, you know, our engineers, engineers, and I think we appreciate like the, like the future of Shopify is going to be basically built on how well our engineering team can execute on, on some of the things we want to build. Okay. So both of you guys are still program, right? Yes. Not, not critical path. And I'd say we're rusty, but, uh, like I read code every week. Now, how much do I write is, is questionable but definitely read read code every week and uh you know I, i think it's important right like culturally like the reason that toby and i do that one is like i want to make sure our teams are thinking about things in the right way and i want to learn i want to stay on the bleeding edge to make sure we're making good decisions and the second thing it, it is therapeutic to write code <laughs> like it's there like it's good like and I, i also want to appreciate how hard it is sometimes You know, I think when you're, you're, you're leading a company and there's, you know, we have thousands of developers and you're, you know, you're like, why is that taking a long time? You're like, you know what? There's some programming that's just hard, you know? And I, I, I like to feel the complexity of writing software sometimes, you know, and it's, and, and it's, it's a humbling experience and it lets me, I think, have a lot of empathy about some of the really difficult things we're trying to do. So as, as DHH said, um, you like being in the flow, right? Absolutely. Yes as a musician and as a programmer, like the flow is, is you, you feel good in the flow. I'm also an expert multitasker. At some point you have to be Toby and I are probably like ADHH of, uh, <laughs> we have attention and deficit disorder. So I could program a bit and, and, and go to hacker news kind of pretty, pretty actively. I'm sure well, we need some sport around that. Like who, like how would you measure effective multitasking? But yeah, at some point you have to get good at, the, at doing that too. So, um, but yeah, Shopify is a technical company. It's funny. I think you were, you, you mentioned earlier in the podcast, you're like, Like, where did you learn Ruby? Um, and I'm like, actually, I'm not that much of a Rubyist. So before Shopify, I did not write a line of Ruby in my entire life. Uh, and do you like it? I, I really like Ruby. I'd say that um, Rails and Ruby have been like, people think like that Shopify was successful despite of those decisions. But I think we, we think that they're, um, you know, they're really great programming languages they're actually fun to write in like it's very exp like ruby's extremely expressive it's easy to read like like those are really important i think we've like from a, an engineering culture like you've got to favor the fact that you'll be spending more time reading code than writing code and you've got to make sure that it's it's you know you're you're in an environment in a language that's actually enjoyable to read it's easy to understand and i think ruby's done a lot of that now some of the things we've struggled with rails like we have struggled with some things and we've contributed back around Like we probably have the biggest monolith on rails on the planet. Um, and I won't get into all the details. If you want to go to the Shopify engineering blog, there's a blog called deconstructing the monolith. That's been pretty popular. Uh, and it's about us adding, um, I'd say the concept of modularity into rails, right? And so rails has engines and you can, you know, you can structure your code kind of the way you want, but the convention out of the box are very, very much optimized. I'd say on getting requests, fetching data and returning you know, a, a web page or a JSON pay payload, right? Like that's the structure of your Rails app. And as it, as it scales and grows, um, you know, where you put your code, how you structure it, when you have a, like a lot of responsibilities in the system is something that Rails doesn't have a lot of conventions around. So what we, what we did, and I think what we added to Rails a lot, and a lot of the teams that are working on large um, Ruby and Rails projects have come to us and talked to us about is, is like how do you start structuring large monoliths with a bit more of a mindset of like their operating systems, 
Right. And what an operating system does is you have a lot of, like our, our operating system has a lot of modules, right? A lot of layers, a lot of modules. And if you, op- if you crack open a Linux kernel, it's like, what do you see? Is you see a bunch of different responsibilities. You're like, here's the drivers, here's the graphic drivers, here's the file devices, here's, you know, memory management, here's, ex- like, there's a bit of a structure, there's a header file for each one, you know? So, so one of the things we have to do, you know, outside of Ruby being a great programming language, it just does, like, how do we, have a software architecture of a large monolith. And that's some of the stuff that I think we've had to invent um, because we didn't want, like we didn't want that to get in the way of us, you know, having to move to another language or something. It's just, we had, we, we were on the bleeding edge of like large scale rails and Ruby projects. And that's something we worked on. And obviously we worked with uh, Stripe on Sorbet as well, which is bringing some, you know, type safety, static analysis. And I'd say uh, modularity are the three things that we've probably get enhanced that have let, allowed us to kind of stay on Rails and Ruby and keep it fast and performant. Uh, so speaking of modules, what is the sneaker mode you mentioned in your Twitter uh, header header image? How the, my uh, sneaker mode, that's a bit of a troll to the sneaker community. Um, you know, I, I don't know if you're, how many sneaker heads there are in, in Germany, but uh, sneakers are kind of a thing on the internet. And I'm a bit too old to have appreciated this before I got this job. Um, I'm almost 50 now. So, you know, I, I, I'm usually like, I've got my, my pair of runners and I, I wear them out, but, um, it turns out the sneaker community has been, um, causing a lot of pain for me, uh, because I, I guess there's a, there's a huge resale value of sneakers. Um, the, you know, Nike and Adidas don't like they, they, they're feeding into the, um, uh, the hypeness of these and they don't actually produce a lot. So, you know, so basically there's millions of bots around the planet who are trying to get sneakers from us. Um, they've caused me to stay up many nights trying to keep Shopify up because they basically DDoS us. They create like, they, they, you know, they, they're, um, they're doing a coordinated DDoS attack on the platform to try and get, you know, when that one sale drops. So we've done a lot of sneaker, I'd say bot protection and throttling and, and work. And I put that in my Twitter profile, just, you know, just to make sure I'm an active member of that community so that I can, I can under, you know, a 50 year old can understand a bit more about, uh, what they're actually trying to do. And I, I, it was my attempt to infiltrate that community to really make sure that, you know, I understand what they're doing. There, there's some good things in that community. You know, I think I, I love the passion about like, they're a bit like programmers. Like they really like what they do. They're super geeky. And, uh, I, I wanted to make, you know, Shopify the best platform to sell sneakers on. So, uh, there is no actual sneaker mode. Like that was a, me going to VS code and typing that line in there. That's not a real, all the other parts our real code. I think that's our shop class. So I think it's uh, <laughs> everything else is real. Okay, so you really use StatsD and so on. Uh, we but do, yeah, we do. Yeah. <laughs> sneaker mode, does it really mean that this, those are people sniping for sneakers, essentially? So the guys that were like a few years ago sleeping in tents in front of the sneaker shops and looking for a special edition of a certain sneaker or what? Actually, exactly what it is. So what you can do is, um, you know, when you're buying online, what like all a bot does is it, it uses your API endpoints and it fakes being a buyer, right? So like the simplest bot is fetch, you know, fetch product page, refresh it until like sold out is false and some are available and you basically API-ify all the way to the cart to check out, right? So it's like, imagine... I could spin up a thousand tasks on AWS that go and basically call the API and says, you know, and, and you, ha- so you have to know the URL and you have to know the shop. Right. So, but if like, you know, kith.com is, is going to drop that fancy sneaker instead of tenting outside the shop, you just, you know, create a program, you open an AWS account or GCP, you, you know, spawn a thousand tasks and you go make believe that you're a thousand people trying to get it. Now there's some complexity about getting, you know, different Gmail addresses. Um, uh, there's this things called residential proxies, which are, you know, um, one, you know, obviously it's easy to block AWS, um, like IP ranges. Now it's harder to understand where things are going. So there's this whole technical community around again, like how do we, you know, how can we gamify the system so we don't have to sleep outside in tents? We can automate the whole thing. And then I can buy a shoe for 180 bucks and resell it for 4,000 bucks. It's literally like a, a, an underground economy happening right now, which means that Shopify, like we have to handle that traffic, right? If, if there's millions of tasks that are really just monitoring websites for when shoes are going to drop, like we had to, you know, make sure that that's, you know, um, that's possible because sometimes it's hard to differentiate between a human and a bot, but that's the, that's the underground kind of sneaker community now, which is um, super creative. There's a lot of programmers that are making a lot of money doing this. And um, you know, we're spending a lot of time to make sure that we, uh, we understand it. Um, 
we, you know, and what we're actually trying to do is we want to give merchant entrepreneurs the tools that they can do what they want, right? If they don't want bots, then they can turn them off if they want. If they, you know, if they want to do a raffle, then they can do a raffle. So there's, there's a bunch of, you know, I think technologies at play now to both detect bots, but also, um, you know, sometimes you want, you know, it's okay if like someone uses a bot and gets one or two pairs of sneakers, that's fine, but I don't want them to have a thousand pairs, right? So you can do super cool AI logic on shipping addresses, on credit cards that are being reused. And you can kind of, like, we're trying to figure out how do we make it super fair, but also um, what people are doing more and more now are raffles, which is super, in theory, super random, which is you sign up, you know, and so instead of waiting in line, you just sign up, there's a, a bingo machine you raffle them off and, and what you're trying to do there is making sure that someone can't sign up a million times with different, <laughs> different scraped Gmail addresses or credit cards. And like there's virtual credit cards now that people can have thousands of credit cards. So I think it's just, it's, it's a cat and mouse game and, uh, it's, uh, it's fascinating from a technology perspective too. Yeah. I mean, starting with residential proxies, those are mostly mobile IPs, I guess, yep. uh, really detecting uh, which one is a bot and uh, which one isn't is, is, is really hard, right? Yeah, exactly. And that's where we're getting into like biometrics, right? Like doing a, like you have to use, you know, Apple Pay, for example, on your mobile device, right? As, as uh, you know, one mechanism. The other mechanism is literally just doing like creative uh, captures. You know, we had a prototype of, you have to, you have to play like a game until you get to level two. <laughs> <laughs> and you just re like, we'll have an ecosystem of games you've got to play. So it's like, you're in line. And if you can play this game and get to level two, then you get into the line. And like basically bots are going to have to start building really fancy AI to be able to play games. And I think people love it, right? Like a, a whole part of, of shopping is the experience of it. You know, I don't know if you've ever gone to Disneyland, it, like you, you guys have Euro Disney in Europe, but you know, people pay a lot of dollars to go to Disneyland and stand in line. And have a great experience you know that's so that's a bit of what we're doing with hype is like if you're standing in line and you want to play a game that's cool right if you want, like it's there, there's whole experience around that and i think that's um it, it, it's fun as a uh you know a programmer who doesn't shop that often to to, to now try and see that we can actually use technology so um you're going to see some game, games coming up um some biometrics and and raffles i think is a three kind of technology plays for uh for hype sneaker bot releases on the internet so uh, would you say that this is also the the, the secret source of, of Shopify in a way that um, to be able to handle huge spikes um, and huge amounts of traffic, potentially differentiate between human traffic and bot traffic? Um, is that the, 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 the work where you spend most of your time or where is it? So we're really good at it. We're the world's best and Every week I have people ping me personally saying we're moving to Shopify because it seems like you can handle all the biggest merchants, you know, from Jeffree Star to Gymshark to all the sneakers. Like we've, we just have the most on the internet right now. So we've been able to um, you know, build the right technology tooling to do that. But it's probably only about 10% or maybe 5% of our engineering team, like the, the hyper high scale. Um, you know, a lot of the, sh a lot of um, the work that we're doing at Shopify is off, uh, is also in the back office, right? So like when you actually run a business, you're getting orders, you're fulfilling them, you're doing fraud and risk detection. You know, we've got fulfillment centers with robotics in them. Um, so like we're, we literally do the entire like uh, commerce infrastructure for the planet almost. So a lot of our engineering effort actually goes into a lot of the other parts, not just the, the storefront, but again, like, like how do you ship things? How do you manage um, inventory? Inventory management's really interesting, like uh, important, right? Like one of the things around commerce is overselling is a bad experience. But um, when you're having like high volume sales, when you're managing inventory across multiple locations, multiple warehouses, rebalancing them, like there's a, a huge amount of technology challenges there. So I'd say, you know, maybe 10 to 15% of Shopify is focused on like the purchasing high flash sales, like high load and scale. And then You know, the rest are really just focused on all the other commerce building blocks. Like, you know, we do payments, risk, fraud, balance, bank accounts, all, all that stuff. So it, it's fascinating to, um, I think uh, Shopify is extremely um, uh, undervalued in terms of the hard engineering challenges we're working on. Mostly because, as you said, we're a supporting actor. We're like the platform behind, behind the brands. Um, so it's our job to be experts at commerce and just take care of the rest for our merchants. And it it's, uh, takes a lot of, you know, where we're trying to, redefine how um like commerce have to, has to happen and a lot of places like a lot of commerce infrastructure on the planet is old 
You know, like if you think about how you had to start a business 10 years ago, it's like you had to go to the bank, you have to sign up and get a banking terminal. You've got to show your ID. You've got to, you, like, how do you find out a where, how do you find a warehouse to put your goods in it? How do you just like, none of that stuff has been technologified really. Like outside of, you know, possibly Amazon who's built it for themselves. Like that is not accessible to like the average human. So what we're trying to do is like rethink all the, all, like all the building blocks of, of commerce infrastructure around the planet and make it a lot simpler to use, a lot more accessible and and a lot more out of the box. And that that requires kind of technology and engineering work across the entire stack from, again, opening a bank account, um, taking money, taking different kinds of money, storing your inventory somewhere, tracking it, doing wholesale, doing pricing, reconciling your books, like doing your taxes, like all this boring stuff that you do, you do have to do as an entrepreneur and as a, as a business, we're trying to like, like lower, lower the learning curve with technology across that whole stack. And I think you did it with a, like a growing product, right? So I think Toby discovered or came up with the idea of Shopify for his snowboard shop, I think in the zeros, right? Um, And now it's like really <laughs> growing the whole time. Um, did you did you do a full stop um, at a certain time? Did you did you say okay, let's let's start from scratch. Let's let's build like I don't know a huge microservice landscape and um, just start from scratch. Yeah, so that's a really good point. Which is um, once like once you you have software out in the wild, like you kind of can't stop it, right? Like, I don't, I'm, unless you know some magic trick, like there's no pause button and we'll get back to you in two years. Now, the gaming industry has that, right? Which is, I, I always uh, envy, you know, the Halo crew, right? They're like, build Halo 1 and they're like, I'm going to go away. We're going to take all those lessons and we're going to build Halo 2. But Halo 1 is just, it's built, it's it's locked in and everyone's playing it. Like, like Shopify is running like people run their business on it. So we had no pause button. We couldn't go away for three years and come up with a, a better version and come back and show it off. Like we had to do it um, in flight. Um, but that's what we've done, I think, over the last you know 15 years is doing that. And I'd say there's a part of Shopify that we rewrite every year. Like we redefine it, right? And, and I think that's one of the, the most interesting technology challenges for me now. And as I get older, um, I know that it's possible to write software from scratch um, the real challenge is how do you evolve it? And I think that's something that our industry has that's pretty unique is we have to evolve this um, in flight. We can't take it down um, and we have to make you know very calculated bets in terms of what what parts do we rewrite and evolve and you know what parts are fine we, we shouldn't touch them for a while. Um, you know and how do you do that with with you know without breaking API compatibility? Like for me that like Shafa is basically an operating system. And if you've worked in an operating system, it's probably the hardest piece of software to work on because you have all those constraints, right? You 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 have to um, maintain the past and you have to build the future all at the same time. And that's, I think, one of the biggest, hardest engineering challenges we have. And the, the, the way we approach that at Shopify is um, uh, to keep moving, like to like we, we try and anticipate what the future is and and we do what we call open heart surgeries, which are the those big refactorings where we're like, oh, That was a one-to-one -one association. That should have been a one-to-n. Shit. Okay, now our API is returning an array instead of a, a single value. Like that's that's a big deal. Like we have a lot of those on the go. Um, you know, there's obviously some techniques to how to solve this. I think we do a lot of. I'd say um, instead of refactoring, you build a new version on the side. It's like, hey, like there's a new way of creating an order. Okay, we'll create a you know an order to API. Now that's a, a shitty name, but like another version of that that's that works that, that can take all the load of the new one, but it has some new features in it. And then we can, you know, we can do some deprecation and we can make that um, the thing that's that's worthwhile. But we do, you know, I think part of my job as CTO is actually to make sure we've got, you know, two or three step change projects every year that, you know, that if I look back that I'd be really mad if I didn't, you know, if we didn't have the ambition to do them, but they're going to be really, really hard to do. And, um, you know, going back to like running Shopify like a game is we know these are long-term bets that we, we have to make to win the, the, the actual, like this battle over the next like 50 years is we have to make these investments. And um, I, I, like my role at CTO is actually to push those because I think naturally a company is going to be afraid of doing those. Um, the rewards for doing these are going to be multi-years in the future. Um, it's not going to be next year, right? Like uh, it's, it's going to be in a couple of years. And uh, so yeah, we, we, we rewrite parts of Shopify all the time. And it, 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 it's, what's interesting is figuring out what parts 
and then how to rewrite like rewrites it's rewrites not really just throw the whole thing i just like like how do you technically want to evolve this piece so so one thing you could easily do is like just partitioning right by shops um i mean you have like big shops you have smaller shops you could form groups of shops and relaunch them uh, piece by piece. Uh, is that something you do? Or well, I think maybe what's more is interesting that, is you, I think you mentioned like, why did Shopify not turn into microservices? Yeah. Right. And I'm like, that's, that seemed to have been the fad of the past. That's what every cool kid was doing. It was like, Hey, like the, the, the answer to complexity is to add more complexity and create more things. And, and so we resisted that. I said, again, we're a bit more like a monolithic operating system, right? Like, like Linux as an operating system or, or Mac OS for that matter, or windows are, they're kind of modular monolithic operating systems and you get some benefits out of that. It means that we can, um, you know, the boundaries of, of like how, uh, the domain of, of commerce works. So it's like you, an order comes in, like you have, you have to do these things, like those things can happen in the same process in the same request. And I don't have to go across network boundaries. Like we can make, like, it's easier to actually refactor when it's a monolith, when you've made some mistakes than it is when you've got microservices and like, oh, that data model's in that other service and we're going to need that now kind of when we do this other operation. Oh, that's going to be expensive. Or we're going to have to do a network hop or... So we've we've resisted the um, uh, the microservices because when you actually look at like the actual changes we've made to Shopify over the last 10 years, it, it's not in like... It, it's not in, I'd say, like technical architecture of Shopify. Like it's not in the fact that we don't... We didn't have the right services or the right network boundaries. It's, it's, it's the fact that we didn't model commerce in an optimal way. Right, like I, it really is about the one to one to one association. So in Shopify, you open a shop, you have one location where you store inventory. But you know what? You have to have multiple locations. Okay, now adding multiple locations, if you think about like that impact on the entire like commerce domain, like that's a, a really big deal. So I think what we've been doing is like trying to look at like a lot more of an API approach and making sure that we've got what we call like the right primitives in place, and uh, and that's where a lot of our engineering works. And and you see like if we spent time like like trying to figure out where things run versus what things are supposed to do, then we would have wasted the last 10 years. I'm, I'm like com completely convinced. Now it's taken some work because, you know, every, you know, microservice evangelist that we hire, sometimes it's hard to detect when we're hiring them and they come in and that's the first thing they do is they create a GitHub repo per team. And I, uh, that's, that's always, I mean, that's going to be the kiss of death, right? Is every team wants their GitHub repo and they're one service. And I think we've tried to create a lot more of a, uh, from a culture, like a, a, a you know, a, a modular, majestic monolith culture of, of uh, using the right architecture for the right problem. And that's what I think the, the best definition of what we've done at Shopify is. So that means that most of your code is in run repository, essentially. Yeah, I'd say the, uh, the server, like the Shopify shop server is one repo. We call it Shopify Shopify because it literally isn't GitHub. It's like the, the organization name is Shopify and the, the, that GitHub repo is called Shopify. Um, and then what, what we've done over the years is we've split out the, um, a, a bit like, like Linux or an operating, like the headless API service, right? A Shopify Shopify, where it literally doesn't have any UI to it. And then we've got, you know, repos for like the web UI for mobile. We've got like, so we have a lot of applications that, um, you know, are separate, uh, like clients that talk to the same Shopify kind of ser monolithic service. So I think, and then we have obviously, you know, uh, a, a lot of apps. So Shopify is like a platform so you can build apps on it. So we we build a lot of things as apps. So that's let us really scale the engineering organization inside and outside of Shopify, but let us have a really, really strong, that again, like it is, it's like a, an operating system, right? Like on Linux, like X windows was separate from the actual kernel. So we've got the kernel of Shopify and we've got like a really good app ecosystem um, and a really good, like you can build different windowing systems for, for Shopify. If, if, if I'm going to, you know, adopt the uh, operating system parlance, like we've got different windowing systems. So, you know, on mobile, we've got the shop app, they all kind of talk to the same uh, backend. So I see, so what we ended up with is we have modularity at Shopify but careful modularity and uh, not split along a line of like um, every team needs uh, modularity, but around the actual like deployment architecture as, as a guiding principle a lot more. So that means that you are using single page web apps, for example, uh, that are accessing the API in the monolith uh, in a way or is it yeah, like our, our, our mobile client, like our Shopify mobile clients calling the exact same APIs as our, our web one is and our automation tools. Like they're all, we're all dog fooding the same API as our, our app developers as for all our, all our front ends as well. So 
This episode is kindly supported by Fastly, the biggest challenger in the CDN market. Fastly is pushing ahead the technical boundaries and is, from my perspective, the best solution on the market. Fastly is known as one of the key drivers of the Edge Cloud movement. In one of the next podcasts, I will talk to Tyler McMullen, Fastly CTO, about WebAssembly and the Edge. Well-known customers of Fastly are Shopify, the New York Times, Reddit, GitHub, and many, many more. If you want to try it all with first-class support, just go to fastly.com slash alphalist. How many engineers do you have? Hmm. I'd say 2,000. Okay. Um, so as mentioned, I had DHH as a guest um, and I actually asked him um, what he would do if he would become the CTO of Zalando, which is a, like a huge European uh, e-commerce company. And they have 1,500, I think. And he replied, quit. <laughs> so how do you think about that? That's DHH role in our community, isn't it? To be the bit of the challenger of everything. <laughs> uh, listen, look around you. And start reference counting all the things that you use to run your life. Your car, the plane that you took a year ago that you haven't taken since. Uh, you know, the, the rocket launch that we, we launched, uh, we watched actually this week and there was, there was one two weeks ago, uh, bringing people to space. Um, the laptop you're using, the operating system you're using, these were all teams of a thousand engineers or more. So like my philosophy is, um, we're going to have to get good at building big engineering teams so we can do big things. And, um, it's intimidating. It's hard. It's not for everyone. Um, but I, I think the world's been impacted by some really big engineering things that we've put a lot of people towards because they're hard and it's challenging. We've seen some really cool innovation. So that, that's my mindset. I'm like, bring it on. Um, I'm the opposite of I quit. I say, bring it on. Um, our challenge is how do we do that and not be miserable? You know, how do we, how do we create communities of thousands of developers? Um, and you know, I, I do have the advantage of, you know, I worked in open source for over 10 years when I was uh, on the Eclipse team and we had thousands of developers in the Eclipse community. You know, we had thousands of developers building on Eclipse as a platform. And, you know, I happened to be in a small, you know, small team that, uh, that was like on the, I guess the core Eclipse team, but there was thousands of developers and it was fun. It was a great community feel. And, and I think that's kind of what we're trying to do at Shopify is like, we have thousands of developers. We're not all working on the exact same like piece of code all the time, but we can see the the value of all the things we're doing coming together in this great thing. Um, you know, we 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 have to build modularity into a platform, so we're not all stepping on our toes. And I, but the the you know we can do more and we can make an impact on more people on the planet by some of the things we're building. So I think it's a great challenge. I think if you asked me this ten years ago, I probably would have answered what DHH answered. But I think I've come to appreciate that um, we can do great things with uh, a lot of people, and it's. You know, my responsibility to create a company where I, I still want to work it, you know, and that, that is hard, right? It is hard to create a company that uh, feels like you don't have cement in your boots as you add more people. Um, but that's my mission in life now is to, to make Shopify a place that I don't want to have to ever leave because I feel like we're still doing cool things and it'd be fun to be a, you know, an intern engineer to even myself uh, feel that we can get some stuff done. So um, I wouldn't quit. Yeah. I would hire another 2000 and that's probably what I'm going to do next year. So I'm still hiring. I <laughs> Very good. I think that the essence is uh, also how you actually cut the teams, right? And um, how you make sure that everyone is working on on hard problems. I think that's that's the essence, right? That you have the the domains where you can, which you can use to to, to partition your work, right? Exactly. We have a hundred teams of ten people, right? Or two hundred teams of ten people. So it's it's not like you feel, but you have the power. And the community of thousands of people, which is, I mean, DHH was a bit, you know, again, he was, he was being this, the DHH self. I mean, the Rails community is thousands of developers. And last I checked, he did not quit the Rails community. Did he? No. Okay. There, there's probably, there's more than a thousand developers. Yeah. So, so he's, he works in a team of a thousand developers. He just, it's not Zalanda or Zalando, whatever you, you call it. Right. So um, that, that, that's what I'm saying. I, I was in DHH's place in an open source community, a thousand developers. I loved it. And I'm trying to create that feel, sense of community and also just, like the software architecture where you can actually, you know, not step on your toes all the time. Okay. Mm, I think one one thing I observe often um, is that engineers and also engineering-heavy organizations don't spend lots of time 
in the problem space, but but rather like quickly go to the solution space. That's also my heart as an engineer. I, I also like to, to actually develop stuff. How do you make sure that people spend their time wisely and enough time in the problem space? I, yeah, I think that's probably one of the biggest evolutions of a software developer. You know, we, we started our careers, um, I'd say just trying to make things work. At least like that's how I remember, you know, my early days in this career. I was like, you know, you're in university, you're in college or whatever. You're just, you're just trying to make things work. You're like, how do I, you know, how do I make this widget show up on the screen? And what's a fast way of doing that? And like, you're, you're like, and that's, um, that's some skills we have to develop. And at least for myself, like I, I had a lot of learning to do just to make things work, make it reliable, like, you know, make it fat, like that's a lot. But at some point, I think you end up pivoting to going, it's not that I want to build software, but actually what I want to do is build an understanding of the world and express it in software. But that, that requires um, you to have the base set of skills. <laughs> but I think that's like what's kept me in this industry for a long time is that is the ability to, to build a really good foundational skill that you can program and you can build things and you, you can, you, you understand how to make things work. But then the, our real job, like our real job as software engineers is, is to understand the world and then express it in software. Not to like, my job is not to build software. It's to understand commerce, be an expert in it, and then use that understanding to express that in what I think is the best representation of software that I can. Um, and I, I agree, like I, I think a lot of engineers in their career don't invest enough in that. Um, um, it's, and I, I think it means we're, we're like, a lot of, like a lot of people are creating shitty software because they, I think they value creating software more than they do solving problems. Um, and it's, uh, but it's, it's a lot of work because again, a software engineer is like our ass is on the line, right? We write it, we build it, we maintain it and we get yelled at whenever something happens, right? If it doesn't run, it's not fast. Like we have a huge amount of responsibility and like, I felt the weight of that responsibility. You know, I, my pager has gone off. I've, you know, been yelled at, especially in the open source community about, you know, not anticipating the right APIs and being a loser. Like there's, there's a lot of weight. So for you to, 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 to add on top of that. Oh, and we have to understand how the entire planet works so that we, our software is, is, you know, is representative and is, is actually solving actual problems. Like that's a lot for us to, to do. Um, but I think that's why this is super exciting. And I, I, I think that's the, the kind of engineer we're looking at at Shopify. Like we have a lot of engineers who, who are entrepreneurs who run their own business. You know, like I want engineers at Shopify to literally run their own store. I've got my own stores. Like I, I'm an expert at Shopify. Like I can out demo Shopify to any person who's using Shopify right now. And that's been my personal mission all the time. Like I want to be the best user. And maybe this is my gaming, a bit of my gaming background, but like, like I want to know the keyboard shortcuts. I want to know like the hacks. I want to know how it works. Um, and I have a personal mission that I could literally, I could out demo Shopify to, to anyone at Shopify and anyone outside of Shopify at any point in time. And that's part of my training regime. Like I use Shopify all the time. And that, again, that's, that's because I want to make sure I build software that that is in the context of commerce, not just building software for the, the fun of doing it. And I, I think a profession probably doesn't talk about that enough, but it's it's uh, extremely important. Are you, are you selling dog goggles or what? Ha, ha, what do I sell? So trick number one is a lot of us with kids, we run our, our kids' uh, school uniforms or school soccer jersey, uh, like all, all these antiquated processes. I don't know, like, I'm not sure if you have kids or not, but your kids get into activities you go to like the parents meeting and they're like, okay, who's going to take the checks and go, go buy the socks and the shorts for soccer. And you're like, do you still do sh checks? I'm like, can't you take a credit card? Like, how do you do that? So I, I you know, I, I was basically setting up Shopify for all the sporting, uh, sporting teams in Ottawa, right. To just modernize <laughs> again. Like, I don't want to have to take a check again. So there, there's literally opportunities around everyone around how they can use Shopify. I sell sneakers online as well, obviously. Um, I do sneaker fundraisers online in, in a shop and, uh, uh I help, I, I help a lot of like friends, like when you work at Shopify, one thing you realize is, is, uh, you can't meet someone, you know, in, in a week you'll meet a, like 20 new people, like three of those are going to be entrepreneurs who have a side business. So I, you just serendipitously, you just meet some, right? Like a friend of mine who's an occupational therapist, uh, basically sells these training devices and she's like, JML can you help me? I'm like, sure. So I help her set up her shop and I, and I end up being like, you know, over time, a bit of a, a helper. And, and what's great about the software is at some point I don't have to help her anymore. 
because it's it's like I, like Shopify has to be super easy to use. So um, it's it's a perk, and a, I don't know, maybe not a perk of working at Shopify is um, it's hard not to meet someone who's not using Shopify. So there's a huge amount of opportunities to 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 try it out. Okay, so you you your best best client yourself in a way, right? My best yes. client, okay. yes, absolutely. Um, like tackling Rails a bit more, um, it's going a step back. So Rails isn't known for for its its performance, um, and you still are very well known to uh, to be able to to handle performance quite well. Uh, how how do you manage to do that? Is there like a secret sauce? Uh, secret performance knowledge on Rails, um, or how do you scale? So for the record, I've done some research with other CTOs. I believe that Shopify's infrastructure spend per revenue is um, the best on the planet right now. So the amount of infrastructure that we spend for the um, revenue that we make is, you know, I, And I, I'd love to take other like send me send me your your AWS GCP bills, but we've we've got we're extremely efficient. So a lot of people said, well, Rails, yeah, you can make it scale if you just throw a lot of computers at it, right? Like that's the thing. It's like, yeah, yeah, fine, but you probably have to spend crazy amounts. We we don't. Now, have we done that? Like it's 15 years of of optimizing our our infrastructure, right? Of being smart around caching, around being smart around. You know, data storage, access, like all, all those things, right? Kind of cascade um, in place. We've obviously investing in Ruby. Like if you look at uh, Ruby 3 now, you know, we've got some MRI work in there, memory management. Like we're, it, it's not like Ruby and Rails hasn't needed work to evolve and get better. Um, but I think our, our mission in life is to be on the bleeding edge of both Ruby and Rails and make sure that we, we test it in like, excuse me, the, the crazy environment that we have. And that we we upstream everything that we find really actively, you know, and that that's kept us, you know, up to date with, uh, you know, making sure that it's it's super fast. So I think the secret sauce is we we upstream really well. We've created, um, you know, like we know how Shopify works, and we've optimized the spots that you probably don't get out of the box. But we have a really good caching system um, called Identity Cache that um, kind of caches our, like it, it's over active record basically that does a lot of uh, caching over active record. That's, you know, uh, we have a huge amount of reads versus writes. So that was super important. Um, we published uh, a blog post recently around using composite keys. So Rails out of the box does not su support composite keys. Now, um, you know, what's interesting for us is we've got sharded uh, databases. So we have multiple shops in the same MySQL instance. Now, when you do, like, if you look at whenever we, we, we fetch an order ID, Like what we really want is we fetch the order ID plus we have a shop ID as the second second key. We uh, so Rails out of the box doesn't do composite keys, so we've been working on that. We launched that. Now composite keys are heavier on write because you've actually have to you know you've got to insert this thing at a, a more precise location. You got to um, so we've done a lot of work around just investing in performance almost every year and upstreaming it. So um, I, I think there's you know there, there there's also room to go. There's some things that aren't Rails that we found Rails wasn't good at. Our, our webhook delivery system, for example, is written in Go. So Rails isn't good at I.O. necessarily. So when you're you're keeping a huge amount of sockets open, that's not the best use of Rails. And we're, you know, that's a very pointy system that we're just like, cool, just, you know, we've got a Go delivery system that does webhooks. We have a uh, web socket um, service that we call Argus, which is basically uh, keeping live connections to the browser. Again, that's very, very, very just connection intensive, IO intensive. That's not what Rails does great. So we, you know, we have a separate service that its entire purpose in life is, you know, open, you know, it's a data pipe of connection to a, a browser, a persistent connection. And we do do that for like live views, uh, like in, in place updates. So we've been strategic and like, we know what Rails is really good at and it's, and, and we've kept it to be good at that. And it's our, again, it's our monolithic, you know, a uh, uh, operating system piece of like all of our transaction, all of our data, um, all of our back office is actually run on that. Um, and then we've known how to optimize it and, and I guess augment it, right? Our front end's written in, you know, it's, it's React and, and JavaScript. So, um, so I think we've been pragmatic and, uh, but yeah, the, we're, we're, we've missed busted, you know, Twitter did the exact opposite of we did. And I think, um, if you look at where we ended up, I think we ended up at a, 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 a pretty good spot after 10 years. But you essentially don't seem to reinvent the wheel um, when I look at your general stack. But I saw a video of you showing your, your internal project management software a while ago. So how you how you actually get shit done at at Shopify. 
Um, we also use, um, at Omar, we also use um, a tool called Crane um, that was developed uh, at Shopify, I think, uh, like a Ruby gem, uh, which does deployment to Kubernetes. Okay. Like, how much how much do you do you build yourself usually? So our, our engineering philosophy is to get the most leverage as possible out of technology we think that we're going to bet on for the next 10 to 15, 20 years um, and do that very carefully. And then when we do it, we kind of go all in. Right. So Kubernetes. So for example, like if you just look at our, our cloud infrastructure, we were in our own data centers up to about three years ago, but we were probably one of the earlier adopters of Docker, probably too early. It causes a lot of pain, <laughs> but like for deployment and um, containerization, we, we container, containerized Shopify a while ago. We saw Kubernetes come out. Um, we, we liked the direction. We liked that Google extracted it out of an existing system, which I think is a really important principle for us engineering wise. Like I love infrastructure to be extracted out of like a concrete use case, right? Rails was that with Basecamp. Um, uh, Kubernetes was, was that with, with Google. And, and I think internally they called it Borg, which was like their internal deployment. So what we've done is we like, we're going to pick Kubernetes. We pick Rails. Um, we pick React. We pick GraphQL. We've picked React Native as what we think is like really good technology decisions about uh, in terms of where they're going. And then we go all in, like I want like open source contributors on each one, right? So if you go look, we, we launched a, a blog with Google last week on some of our containerized uh, security work that we've done, right? About securing containers, because one of the attack vectors of the cloud is someone, you know, updates your container registry with some malicious container that hasn't been signed by you. And, you know, you can go execute some random code. So, um, so what we've done is the five, six technology we've gone all in with, like we really go all in like as in contributing to the open source communities active and becoming experts in those so that we can actually get the best out of those. So, so we're, we're um, probably different than a lot of other engineering organizations where they go just, you know, we don't care what tools you use, just make it work, build a microservice and we'll just call you. Like, I think we're extremely opinionated about what we're going to use. Um, but I think that's let us um, become experts at, at the few things that we are, we want to be experts at and also contribute upstream, right? The fact that we've got, um, you know, we have some committers on MRI, on Rails, on Kubernetes, React Native. We've, I think we've got probably one of the most active React Native communities now around Shopify that we're working with Facebook and Microsoft on. So I think it's, again, it's a lot of engineers be expert, experts at it. And then the other thing that we get is t people can move between projects at Shopify. Like I want a, like a somewhat standardization. So like, like engineers can go and, and move and it feels like we are kind of part of the same community and I can go and I can get to a new code base. And it's like, I know kind of generally if I, if I know these kind of technologies at Shopify, like I'm going to be able to get stuff done. Right. So I think that's, that's been super important. Um, and that's, that's kind of how we roll. And, and when there's something that we, we don't see that's out there, we do build ourselves. So I think the video you saw of some internal tools that we use to build, like it's almost like our company tracking system, right? So we got issue tracking in, I don't know, Jira or GitHub for teams, but we had no company tracking. Like how do you know who's working at what in the company, right? Not at the task level, but literally at the project admission level. So we built kind of a, you know, our internal tool to do that. We've built our internal tool around uh, service, dis service discovery, which I think is fascinating, which is within a company, like what services are actually in production right now? Who owns them? What's the quality of them? Where are they? Like, it, it, it's, it's fascinating how in the developer community, we spent so much time on tools to help you write code. But when it, when it comes time to tools around running code, we don't have much, right? You deploy to production, I guess. But like, where's the, 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 like, the manifestation of like, what are all the things that a company's running? What are their security levels? Where's their PII? So we built a service catalog. Um, we built that about six years ago, so it's it's pretty mature. Um, and what's great about it is like, like you know, like I heard that we have a delivery service. I go in, I type delivery, it lists me all our you know things called delivery. I can click on it, I can see who owns it. Um, and we have a lot of our of apps that we build internally. So I can just it just provides a lot of visibility, easy to go see where the code is, where's the GitHub repo, where's it? You know, we we have tiering of services, so it's like what cluster is it in? How do I get access to it? Like all that is there and discoverable. Um, so in the same way, GitHub has made your source code discoverable. We wanted to make our services discoverable. Um, so we'll, again, we invest in a small number of tools that I think we think are going to make us 10 X better. And those are two that I think we 
we haven't open sourced yet. Stay tuned. Okay. You're also working on development in the cloud, I guess. Is that because Docker is so slow on Mac or? <laughs> you, you saw my tweet yesterday. Uh, yeah. So we've, uh, we spent a lot of time trying to make developers hyper productive. And we, we had this internal tool called dev, which was again, like, um, It wasn't using Docker on your laptop, but it was using some, you know, magic hypervisor stuff in the operating system to create kind of developer environments. Um, it was one command called dev up. So you go to any GitHub repository at Shopify, you do get up, uh, dev up, and it does, you know, all your dependencies, gets all your services running, you know, runs Elasticsearch, et cetera, all that. Now we, we found is the development environments are just, there's just so much crap, right? Someone has wrong settings, wrong configuration, conflicting versions. We just, we, so Our, our monitoring of errors for developers getting set up, which is going up, was going higher. It was taking longer to get set up. So we're like, you know what? Like we're, we're basically building Shopify for every commit in the cloud to run tests, right? Like we're building it, we're deploying it. Like, why don't we just have a fleet of those available at any point in time? And I can have an instance of Shopify running without having it locally. So um, we, we, I think we launched that yesterday, I believe internally for some, some parts of Shopify. <laughs> Yeah, and our our our, our bet there is um, one the tooling's a lot better. So VS Code, I don't know if you use the um, some of the remote tooling in VS Code. It's really well done. So the VS Code team was able to build VS Code so that you can actually run a headless version of VS Code on the container, and that that version of VS Code has the language server running. It has you know the file system. It's got all that, and you can run a local version. And it's literally it's almost like X Windows where like all the computations happening in container, you can just edit the code and push it. And it, it's really transparent. It's super fast. Um, and with the value of like your containers are up and running, like your dev environments are just always available. So it takes seconds to get up and running. It's reliable and you can throw them away. And the other thing that's cool now is we have these cool magic URLs. So if you want to, you want to send your development environment to someone else to try it out, like, Hey, I, you know, I, add this thing, go, go test it out. You can just send some URL to someone, they can log in and they, they can just try out what you're running. Right. So I think it's, um, I don't think the tools were ready for this a couple of years ago. Um, but I think they're, they're there now. So I'll share more on Twitter in the coming months as we, we kind of hack on this a bit more, but uh, I'm pretty excited about it. Yeah. I think it's cool. It's like the, the next level of, of, of staging environments, right. That you're actually able to modify the code, um, which, which is brilliant. Right and show to your colleagues. Exactly. Uh, it's nice. And there's a lot of boring th things that have to get done to set up your environment. Like, why are developers doing that? You know, like dependency management and updating. Like, we should just have pre-canned environments that have that. Um, so, I, yeah, again, it's like like developers' time is extremely precious. We should be extremely um, hungry to, to save as much as we can and make it as easy as possible. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Cool stuff. So, do you have a, a favorite piece of technology currently something you like recommend to everyone and uh, annoying your friends with or huh. i was annoying a lot of people about react native um and I, maybe it's a bit more mainstream now but uh you know I was, i was pretty annoyed at developer productivity you know we had all these cool mobile apps we wanted to build at shopify and next thing you know <clears throat> we build the android one or the ios one and it's just like hey we have to hire another team <coughs> Sorry. And I was like, that's kind of, that's weird. Like I, you know, from a mindset perspective, I'm like, I, I love developers that had a range, you know, like, I'm like, is the Android one and mobile one and web one, are they that different? No, there's some, there's some platform things that matter if, of course, but like 90% of it's the same. I'm like, why, why have we created like a, a fragmentation of, of app developer kind of ecosystems? And that really, it pissed me off. It pissed me off from a developer product productivity. It pissed me off that I can't have teams that own web and their two mobile apps as like one team. Like I've got, we had three teams for everything at Shopify. Like it's a complete waste of time. But the reason that that exists is every platform has been trying to, you know, like lock in their developers, right? Like iOS is, or, you know, Apple's like, I want like full on an Apple development. And then, you know, Android is doing the same thing. And then desktops are doing the same thing. Um, but I think, you know, between Facebook, Microsoft and Shopify, <clears throat> we're really applications and we're doing the exact opposite is I want to make it easy as possible to, to build applications on different platforms. So I, um, I'm pretty bullish on, on react native, um, from a technology perspective, what it's trying to do is not, um, it's kind of not rocket science. Like we've built cross platform environments before, like the web browser, 
if you think about it, the web browser takes a definition of a bunch of things and renders <laughs> native widgets right in your browser like that's kind of what react native is doing is like we'd um, like it, 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 like we've done this before. Um, and it's, it's, it's a really good environment. And I, I love that they've, it's also pragmatic. I think these environments need, uh, escape hatches so you can do really native things on platform. Um, and that's available to you. So I, listen, I've annoyed everyone at Shopify about React Native, but we're, I, I don't have to convince people about it anymore, but I think it's still, uh, it, it's still early in their days. And I think it's, um, it's something that, uh, that companies who are application developers, like we should be fighting for productivity of developers. And again, we it's been fragmented and um, Shopify is gonna invest a lot to make sure that, um, that React Native is, is a really good environment for developers, is fast um, and easy to build things in. So our, um, our shop app is built in React Native. Our, uh, we have a version of our POS, it's built in React Native. Uh, and more to come. So it's we, we've got some apps in production that are um, having a huge amount of traffic. So I think that's that's one technology that I've been bugging people about. Um, what's another one? A lot of data streaming work recently. Um, it feels like our industry we're good at like uh, operational data stores. So it's like I can like we know what MySQL can do, <laughs> you know. And we've been you know we, we've been I'd say we've been hacking MySQL a lot recently around re resiliency. Um, so we've, we've had some upstream contributions around doing, um, like query, um, monitoring in MySQL. So we actually know the cost of different queries and we can do tripwires, but that we're kind of like hyper optimizing that space. If you look at the data streaming side of engineering, like how do people do, uh, transforms, right? Like how do you do uh, data pipelining? How do you bring, like, how do you augment data? Like there's, there's a huge amount of technology. It doesn't feel like it's baked. So I've been working a lot with our teams on just like, how do we, um, how do we have like, I'd say enhanced data sets at Shopify and where does that data go? Right. It's like you extract it from MySQL. How do you extract it? How do you do, um, like super complicated data transformations to build like dimensionally model modeled data? How do you augment it? And how do you, where do you put it back? Like, like super simple example. Like if I want to calculate the customer, the, the, the lifetime value of a customer. Cool. Like that's a pretty operationally expensive thing. You don't do that in your rails app. You know, like every night, like, so it's like, we got to stream this. So how do you stream it? How do you, do you do bin log streaming? How do you do the join? Do you put that data back into MySQL? What is there data that you don't put back? How do you do that at scale? Um, so that's the, again, like there's no, it's, it's not like a technology is in like this one algorithm, but it's like the domain of, I'd say data engineering is in the early days. And um, we're doing a lot of that at Shopify these days. So again, if you're a data engineer <laughs> listening to this, we have a huge amount of work with, you know, Beam, Starscream, um, Druid, uh, um, and and I'll, again, a lot of homegrown stuff around just like, how do we how do we do this at scale? So super, super interesting. Geek, uh, we can geek out for, for ages on, on data streaming technology and how to, you know, how to do that with operational, analytical, and streaming data all on the same platform. It's- uh, Sounds- it's a bit of the wild yeah, so, west. So it's like great, great data challenges that you also have there. Like really, really looking at all the data and all the all those all those events that flow in and out. As a last question, I have a little surprise for you. Let, let's say, uh -oh. let's say, let's say, uh -oh. <laughs> no, no, no worries. Let's so, say we now go shopping for new sneakers in, in a Shopify store and put in a pair of classic editor sneakers into the cart and now click on checkout and your CEO, Toby, gave me a secret coupon code called uh, JML2009 and um, I enter it and then there's like a secret time machine Easter egg that you don't know about. And it now mm -hmm. takes us back to the year 2009 and we observe yourself for a while. I think you, you've been working for a strange company called HP back then. And uh, now you get the chance to whisper something into, into your ears. Uh, what, what would it be? Oh, if I can go back in time and whisper. Hmm. Is it about life or programming or what whatever you want, whatever you want. It's it's it could also be about winning in the lottery or <laughs> abusing the stock market. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, that's a, a cheat answer. Um I'd say for like a developer, um like one of the hard lessons I had was I I often built things for me. You know, and I think a lot of times you're building software for other people and, and, and like I say, like other people consuming it, other people contributing to it, other people who are going to help you out. So I've, I've become like, I've transformed myself to become, I'd say, a, a, a almost a read me, uh, 
uh, fanatic of like, I want to make sure the software that I write, that people are inside my brain when I write it, because I know that more people are going to spend time trying to understand what the hell I was doing. And I make it really, really easy. And I, I spent so much time thinking that programming was about was about like puzzles and tricks and only smart people can be able to read my code. And now I'm like, I've taken the exact opposite approach. And what I love about it is that I get a lot more help in what I want to build, you know? So it's like, like think about the software you're writing, like your job in life is to get as many people excited and contributing and helping you the possible. Right. Um, so like I always start every project with like, I, I literally spend a day on the readme file. I'm like, why, I'm just going to tell you what I have in my mind. And I want to, I want to share that early. And I think like, as, as a kid, like we're taught that your job in life is to, is to take the homework assignment from the teacher and get a, a perfect score right away and not talk to anyone about it. And I think I, 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 I kind of encapsulated that in my DNA for way too long, which meant that my job was to go know, like show the world how smart I was without, you know, without involving people, without asking, without making it easier for people to help me. Um, and like, it, it took me way too long in life to figure that out. So I'm, I'm, uh, I wish someone would have whispered that to me, which is again, like, uh, you've got to like both build software and your habits around the fact that the more people you get excited and interested and be able to help you, the better the outcome is going to be and figure out how do you build that into your habits. So again, for me, it's like, I write readme files and I send it out going, I'm about to build this. What do you think? And then I, you know, I build the next version. I'm like, Hey, what do you think? How do, like, and then it, it, I find it's, 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 um, it's helped me when it's been motivating. Um, I've gotten people to take over the things I build. I, I build communities around them. You know, like there's a lot of things I build internally at Shopify. That I, like I build the first version, I get people excited. I but I explain and I I, I don't build it for me. Um, and I had a, a really hard um, lesson at some point. Um, I ended up writing a, a book with a, a friend of mine on on software, and we wrote the first version of the book, and uh, we gave it to a reviewer, and the reviewer was like, "This is shit." And I was like, what, what do you mean? I was like, this is a freaking piece of art. Like we just spent a couple of months heads down writing this, like, and, and his answer was so, so good. All he said was you wrote it for you. You never write a book for you. So I think that's, that's my advice. Again, this is a long winded answer is like, um, don't do things for yourself, figure out how you can do things, involve people and understand who's, who's like, why you're actually building something in the first place, right? So. Thanks a lot, JML. Was a was a pleasure talking to you and a very good answer on the last question. <laughs> looking looking forward Toby, looking well. forward to see you again. Tobias, Toby, thanks for having thanks me. Thanks a lot. It's a pleasure. Thanks again to our sponsors, Fastly and MongoDB. To learn more about the Fastly services and get first class support, just visit fastly.com slash alphalist. And to try the new cloud product of MongoDB called MongoDB Atlas, just go to cloud.mongodb.com and use the promo code PODCAST2020 to get started for free.